remember the first day that I began to wear my headscarf, also known as hijab. I remember vividly walking up to my middle school door. Yes, I started wearing it in middle school, my very first day of middle school, going up to the door and feeling my knees shake, my stomach clench. And I was afraid. I wasn't afraid to be Muslim. I wasn't afraid to wear the hijab itself, but I was afraid of how people would react. The night before I decided to put on hijab, I was 11 years old, and I was in my, in my room. And at the time, 11-year-olds didn't have smartphones. So I was using a home phone, and I was going through a call list, and I was calling all my friends. And I was like, hello, are you still going to be my friend if I wear a headscarf? I'm going to wear it tomorrow. Are you still going to be my friend? And I remember getting some reassurances and some rejections. So the day that I came up to that door, I was so scared. And you can only imagine that because 9-11 was still fresh in the minds and the hearts of Americans. So on that very first day that I stepped foot to become a hijabi and represent what I find to be my liberation, my freedom, as a Muslim woman, to allow people to see me, my soul, before they see the rest, before seeing the rest of me, my skin, my bodily appearance. So on that very first day that I took that step, not only in my piety, not only in my spirituality, but as in my identity as a human being, as a Muslim, girl, I was called everything under the book that you can imagine. I was called Osama bin Laden's niece. I was told, go back to your country. I was told, why are you wearing a towel on your head? And I even had a student in my art class, and I was very timid at the time. I didn't have the confidence that I have today. So I was sitting, and I was like shivering. I was scared. And this kid goes up, he wraps a sweater over his head. And he takes two markers that were sitting in front of us in the art supply room. And he took them out and he made a gun. And he, sa he started making gun noises and he was saying, look at me, I'm a terrorist just like Yasmin. And I remember feeling so crushed that day because all I wanted, and even till this day, all I want is to spread peace, to spread love. And being misrepresented like that, was one of the most heart-clenching moments because it was my very first time that I felt injustice. Now, that was not the last time. In high school, it was a new ball game. I started to have thicker skin. I went through all of these experiences in middle school, and middle school kids are crazy and mean, but high school was different in the, in the sense that I had my own educators teaching misrepresented misrepresentations of who I am and my people in front of my face, in my classroom, the place where we, as a society, are supposed to be enriching the minds of human beings. But I felt like the opposite was taking place. So right here, on my exam, I remember it was a religion chapter of my AP Human Geography class. There was this question. And it really stuck to me, and I remember it word for word. And it said, who are the most oppressed in the religion of Islam? A, children, B, men, C, women, or D, all of the above? And the correct answer, according to the answer key, was women. And I remember that was the day, that was the turning point where I was like, hey, I will not let somebody misrepresent who I am. And I remember going up to my teacher and I said, I, will, I refuse to answer this question. I left it blank. And knowing me, I was the type of student that I wanted to get hundreds all the time. So me leaving question blank was a really big deal for me. So I did so. And he told me, I'm so sorry. This is what we are given. This is what we are given to teach you for your exam. And that really stuck with me. 
Because all these misrepresentations are everywhere. In classrooms, in news platforms, in political rhetoric, it's everywhere. And I, Yasmin Zair, a Muslim woman, am troubled by that, or was troubled by that. Because you see, these were the limitations that were placed upon me. People look at me and think that either A, I don't know how to speak English, B, my father forces me to do things, C, I am oppressed. And the reality of it is that these limitations, the only limitations in my life, are the limitations of people telling me what my freedom should be. And that's an oxymoron in itself. Because an individual chooses their liberations. An individual chooses how they define their freedom. And by telling me that I am oppressed when I feel the exact opposite is troubling, rationally. So later on in my high school career, after that incident, I joined basketball team. And I was like, I am going to show people that this headscarf does not stop me. This headscarf does not limit me. I will participate in everything that people think I cannot participate in. So I joined my basketball team, and I was doing really well. And I came to another barrier, another adversity that came into my life. And that was when I wanted to go into varsity. So when I was going into varsity, and they were trying to put me in, to get up, they told me that there is a Florida law that states that anyone that is wearing a headscarf cannot do so unless there is literature or legal proof that you are wearing a headscarf for religious purposes. So I fought for this. I got a lawyer, and I was able to play basketball with my headscarf. By doing this, I was the very first hijabi Muslim girl in my high school history to ever play sports, ever. And in doing so, I wanted people to know, I want people to see that no, my religion does not limit me. And no matter what people tell me my religion does to me, I am free. So when, when I went to the University of Florida, my dad and I were going back home, and we were driving for a while, and I was supposed to sit in the passenger seat. And for some reason, I decided not to. I was like, I'm going to sit in the back, I'm going to read my book, I'm not going to wear my seatbelt, and I'm just going to enjoy the ride. Shortly after, I just hear metal crash. I didn't know what was going on. My head slams against the driver's seat. All I see is glass. And I remember that moment so vividly, because that was the moment where I thought, if I sat in that passenger seat that day, I probably wouldn't be standing here today. And so I put all of this together. I put the limitations that society places on me. I put that moment where I could have not been standing here. And I said, who am I? What am I doing? What did I leave on this earth? If I had gone, what mark did I leave? How would people remember, not even just me, but the impact that I made in society? It's easy to sit around and whine and, 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 and complain about the struggles that we face, but being put in a situation where I could have not been here today made me have an existential crisis at the age of 18. I sat down, and I realized that people hate me for no reason. And I may die at any moment. 
and that sounds very morbid, but you and I, we don't know when our next breath will be. We don't know. There's uncertainty in that. It could be from a hate crime. It could be from a car accident. It could be from a plane crash. It could be from falling off your bed. But these things made me realize that everything that I went through, I went through for a reason and that I should use it to fuel positive change instead of reeling in on these negative instances, these negative problems, and taking them to another level. So I went on my Twitter account. And I know that I can draw sometimes. I draw for fun. And I was like, I'm going to do something with what I can. I have paper, I have pencils, that's all I need. I took my paper, I took my pencils, I posted on Twitter. It ended up getting shared a lot. I had people in my DMs from G Germany, Japan, China, you name it. They were in my DMs. And they were sending me pictures of their family and themselves. And I was like, this is great. I'm going to do something for once. I'm going to make an impact. I'm going to leave something in this world. Because if I do leave, for whatever reason, I will know confidently that I left something. That I left something concrete. So this was my very first drawing that I did. And 100% of the proceeds went to Syrian refugees. And this right here is a drawing of a giraffe that one of my high school friends contacted me. She heard about my project. And the money went towards the Syrian refugee that is presented before you. These are human beings that, just like me, are misrepresented. People see them as a threat. People see them as danger. Even though all they want is to be free. All they want is the pursuit of happiness. So I took that and I identified with their struggle because I've been there. And I used that specific population as a means to sharing my own struggles and putting it into something that they can have in their hands. So I challenge you to take any barrier you've ever experienced, any hardship you've ever encountered. And I know that each and every one of you sitting here today has gone through something horrible, or has gone through something very tough. And I want you to take that challenge and use it for good. Identify with a population. Take something. We all have something good to share. We all have some strength whether it's comedy, whether it's art, whether it's something that's not even concrete, and use it for good. And I promise you, the feeling is amazing. Because at that moment that you do that, you are limitless.